We are set to go racing here in the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup presented by BF Goodrich Tires. And uh, if what we've seen this year is any indication, uh, the, the guys that are in charge of repairing the bodies on these cars, they're standing at the ready back of the paddock. Well, They'll probably have some work to do before we get to the second half of the doubleheader tomorrow. If you think the guys that work on the bodies of these cars are nervous and biting their nails as these cars roll off for their parade lap, talk about John Dune and Kyle Kimball from Mazda. They get uh, a bill for groundskeeping, I feel like, every track That's we go right. to, from drivers dropping rear and front wheels and digging up some of the grass. But I'll tell you what, this is so awesome to be back here at Portland International Raceway. I actually lived here in Oregon the last two years before making the move out to Indianapolis, and whether it's Pat's Acres Racing Complex down the street, where a bunch of the IndyCar drivers raced go-karts as kids back in the 90s, or right here at PIR, people in the Northwest love their auto racing. MX-5 Cup Racing is about to be some of the best stuff they see all weekend, and uh, I am so excited to get this thing going. How about before we go green flag racing, we welcome in Jake Query on Pit Road. Jake? Thank you, Mark. It is a great day here in Portland, and it's great to see this Mazda MX-5 Cup take to the racetrack. Right now, in doing so, they do so in 67 degree temperature but of course as typical of the northwest absolutely very little humidity you can't even feel it so it's a very thin air for these cars to drive track temperature at 90 degrees at various points up towards 100 degrees on the track at its hottest that would be in that turn seven and eight area when they make that turn to turn number eight if the skies clear up just a little bit here, they will see Mount Hood, the 11,000-foot summit of it, right in their view. It makes for a spectacular view here at Portland. That's one of the things the drivers love about it, Mark, and it's, of course, one of the great backdrops here at a great racetrack that's about to see these cars get to racing here this morning. And how about the crowds we've had yesterday and today, Nick Hillman? It, it, it's clear people are thrilled to death that uh, that, uh, that racing has returned to, to PR. Absolutely spectacular. We see fans uh, lining the hill there just outside of turns 10, 11, 11 and 12 and the grandstands up and down the front straightaway are filling in on a Saturday here in Portland. Mark Janes, they got the 26 drivers lined up uh, two by two as we are set to go racing here in Portland. Uh, Sparks, Oxner, Bickers, Lee, Henderson, Stout, Rolan, Allison, Lamb, uh, those among the top ten. Green flag is out. Are they starting to fan out five or six wide? The question is, Dick Gilman, who is going to get to turn one first and who is going to keep it clean? A little bump up to the 77 of Oxner, and we've got cars spinning all over the place behind them in the entrance to turn one. Yeah, four, five, six, seven cars. They're still wrecking at the exit of turn number two. We've got a local yellow, and I assume that we may go red because there is a lot of debris uh, all over the racetrack. We see the 44 machine of Austin Allison, who had such a good qualifying effort, was involved. The 03 of Ashton Harrison, the only female driver in the series, is involved as well. Uh, and we've got a full course yellow. Todd Lamb is involved in this accident, Mark. A lot of really good drivers with some torn up race cars. We also see uh, the youngster, Robert Noaker, who picked up a win at Mid-Ohio. There is his car. Some heavy, heavy right front damage as absolute carnage here in the first couple corners of Portland in the MX-5 Cup. Just a lot of cars uh, that, to try to get through a very confined space. Uh, Hernan Palermo, one of those guys that is contender week in and week out, as you pointed out. We saw him get out of his car, and he's standing there with hands on hips, and uh, my goodness. Yeah, there's there's a look at Ashton Harrison's car as one of the safety crew members going to try to back her onto the racetrack. Uh, there is the 44 of Austin Allison. Who well, had, the wipers uh, work. Well... <laughs> That's the least of his concerns we, at this that, point. At least the wipers still work. Uh, pretty heavy left front damage. Uh, as you see, the Wine Society sponsorship on that car, pretty heavily damaged. So, uh, boy, rough, rough start to this event. And, and uh, Todd Lamb involved as well as that car's parked off of the racetrack. We see uh, here's another car uh, smoking and making their way through. That's car number 69. Uh, that is Michael Dynan, who qualified in the top 10. So, Boy, Mark, you just hate to see this because, again, this is race number one. And for these these teams now, they've got uh, their work cut out for them to try to get these cars repaired to go racing. And, and there's Brian Ortiz. Boy, Mark, I don't know. <laughs> we got a lot of contenders. This no, is going to be, yeah. be a big, big uh, curveball thrown in the championship. Uh, race control, not very specific, Nick. Debris basically all over the place is, is what they've said. That's pretty <laughs> fair. <laughs> that, that's one, two, fairly three. accurate. So, uh, Jake Query, uh, the, your activity, a little busier than you're used to early on in this event. And in addition to that, 
you can definitely smell a lot of burning rubber because there are a lot of tires that are, of course, rubbing against the inside of these Mazda machines. Right now, as a matter of fact, one of the safety crew comes down with a bit of an extinguisher to put out a fire. That's on the front right of Robert Noaker. Also along Pitt Road right now, so far just four have come in. Drake Kemper has also come to the attention of his crew, Brian Ortiz, which is very key also on pit road so we have everybody basically has the same issue and that is rubber that was coming off due to just rubbing and vibrating against any damage that might have been taking place on the front right side of their machines and everybody goes up as a matter of fact watching now drain kipper's car goes up they're going to make a change to that front right as for robert noaker let's talk about the young man coming off the win at mid ohio this looks like it's going to be impossible for him to return because the rubber is all entirely off the rim on that front right. There was also a brake fire, and as a matter of fact, Robert Noaker is getting out of that number 13 machine. Mark, we'll take another look at this incident, and I'll, of course, recap everybody that has come along pit road, and we'll try to talk to Robert Noaker here in just a minute as well. Yep, tow trucks and uh, flatbeds and whatnot. Nick Yeoman, what do we count? Some six wide going into turn number one? Yeah, it looks like, uh, boy, I got about the first seven or eight cars. They were even beating and banging, and then uh, back around Hernan Palermo and, uh, and Tony, you got a good look at this replay as well. Michael Dynan. Boy, I, things just funnel up down there to turn one. Uh, they were getting wide on the racetrack, trying to go three and four wide, and it actually kind of looked like there were two or three separate incidents. Yeah, I, and this is a great look at it right here, and I don't ever want to place blame because, as you guys know, as, a, as a commentators, that's not our job. We're not officials. I'm not going to sit here and lecture anybody, but I look. it looks like from my angle that the 20, that lime green car from Slipstream and Hernan Plurum, just kind of hopped the curb yeah. way down on the inside, and that threw him back up into the two drivers that were to his left, and when you guys know, you hit that curb, tires come up off the ground, it's real hard to turn the car when the front wheels aren't co contacting the pavement and i think that's really what started this let's take another look at it there's a great look at all of them a little bit of a hip check there into robert styles they got going but yeah palermo and brian ortiz just way down on the inside of that turn one curbing that launches them up into the drivers to their left hand side and wow i knew it was going to be physical at the start of this and mark you made the comment about the guys fixing the bodies nervously watching and i knew it was going to be rough but i didn't think it was going to be that rough as uh, ashton harrison gives a salute to the crowd thanking them for coming out but i really didn't expect that rough of a start here uh, sparks bickers Rolan, stout oxter the top five uh, when we resume racing let's go back to pit road and jay query brian ortiz is going to join the back of the field they managed to get the changes made to the four machine he is off drake kemper also they made substantial changes on the right hand side got a new tire on him he is off robert noaker is out of his car We'll try to catch up to him in just a minute here, Mark. Interesting to note, Nick, as we talked about, you pointed out some of the drivers that were involved and going to finish uh, deep in the field, guys that are normally contenders, and Jake, you're with one of them, Robert Noaker. Yeah, obviously disappointed, and I can tell very emotional. Last time we talked was at Mid-Ohio in Victory Lane, but this is racing. One race, and then all of a sudden you come back. Take me through what happened there at the start of the race. Yes, I knew uh, just... Everyone started fanning out, and I tried to go around the outside, and uh, it's just a little too late trying to get to the left of everyone. You were obviously, when you got out of the car, I could tell you were very emotional. What is the exact emotion, not only of the disappointment, but how much is there concern now that this will not only affect this race, but the entire weekend for you in terms of getting back out and trying to get repairs? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, really, I just see what the front of the car looks like, and, uh, yeah, I really, really don't know what what's all going on there obviously a lot of work to be done i appreciate the time and good to see that you're okay though thanks that's robert noaker he was very emotional when he got out of the car came over and just kind of dropped his head down mark and that crew is going to go to work but to his point that front right of the car has a lot of damage in particular they're taking a long hard look at the brakes there was a fire there that they had to extinguish they've removed the tire from the car itself and we'll see whether or not this is something that's terminal for the entire weekend for that machine. I mean, we see the 84 of, 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 of Lamb, the 4 of Ortiz, uh, the 20 of Palermo, and the 13 of Noaker, who you just heard from. And Nick, these are guys that we're normally used to seeing running at the front of the pack. Yeah, Todd Lamb's uh, car is on the back of a flatbed. Uh, there's the look of the 03 of Ashton Harrison. There's Lamb's car. He is uh, out of his car and done. Uh, quick look at Ortiz's car. It looks like that they can at least get that car repaired, that he can continue on in this race. Uh, any chance of winning is probably gone for Brian Ortiz, so he's going to be uh, certainly in damage control mode uh, to try to stay uh, third in points because Nico Rieger and Robert Stout uh, 
all indications, Mark, look like both of those drivers were able to make it through that accident, uh, which is pretty amazing considered that uh, Rieger started in the 11th spot. So, yeah, this is, uh, is going to be a, a major curveball thrown to the championship mix, and, and a lot of drivers could have just seen their hopes of the championship dashed. Uh, points paying only through 20, uh, I believe, Tony, in this championship, and that's huge for those that is Nick say, uh, say is it contention for a championship. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the good, and that's the bad part about having a wildly popular category like Global MX5 Cup when you're one of the competitors in it. It's great to go out there and race against a ton of other drivers, but when you only pay points down to 20th position and you're involved in a big wreck like this on the very start, if you aren't able to continue and pick up a DNF 21st through wherever the rest of the cars run, that means you're leaving here with zero points after a full day of work yesterday, qualifying this morning. And you guys got to remember, not a lot of these teams are based west of Texas. So a lot of these cars and drivers have made really long trips out here to the Pacific Northwest. They're rewarded with obviously wonderful weather, a fun racetrack, and a pretty cool weekend. But when lap one, corner one, sees you get taken out, uh, the feeling of fun dashes pretty quickly. So tough break for a lot of these teams, Mark, like you said, for sure. Hey, we gave a shout-out to BF Goodrich. Let's talk about also the commitment of uh, the title sponsor, uh, the folks at Battery Tender, and, and what this series means to them and what they mean to the series. Yeah, absolutely. Michael Prelick is here. I saw him down on pre-grid, and I, I haven't seen Evan yet today. I hope she's here. But, uh, man, you talk about a really cool company and more really a family it's the fact that the prelics are involved in this series with their company battery tender it's a great program so we're really happy to have them here uh they support global mx5 cup racing and, and michael he just likes to be here and hang out and watch the racing and he's happy to be a part of victory lane and he just enjoys good racing so to have a nationally known company like battery tender support this kind of racing it's huge uh, obviously we all know racing you, if you're going to make it big time, you know, you need to have legitimate backing. You need to have legitimate names behind you, not just money, but notoriety. And Battery Tender in the automotive industry brings that to Global MX-5 Cup Racing. Um, so very cool to have them here. We're very grateful. And, Mark, your words perfectly describe it. They have great commitment to the series. Uh, they do a lot. Remember, when we get to victory lane after this race is over, the Battery Tender Hard Charger Award, that goes every single yep. race, $1,000 to the driver and $1,000 to the crew chief of the car that passes the most other race cars under green flag conditions. So uh, they certainly are committed to making Global MX-5 Cup racing thrive here in the States. We've talked about the durability and the reliability of these cars, and I don't know that we've given enough credit to that uh, two-liter two engine that powers these race cars. I mean, uh, let's face it, they put it through the paces over the course of a race weekend. Oh, the guys at Long Road Racing, of course, get a great product from Mazda, but yeah, uh, Mark, you're exactly right. What Mazda supplies, uh, these are, people don't really understand when I say this, but these are roadsters. These were cars that were built in the factory and are born, uh, for lack of a better term, to be daily drivers or your weekend sports cars. And then Mazda buys a fleet of them. They send them down to Statesville, North Carolina, long road racing owned by Glenn, his wife, Alana. And just in about two, two and a half weeks, the team down there at Long Road retrofit by adding and removing roughly 250 parts to these roadsters, these street cars, that turns them in to race cars, and that's what you see here out here on track, that two-liter engine mark that you hit on. Uh, is it is it putting out 800 horsepower? No, but the fact is it makes a lot of speed for a very light and nimble race car, and these drivers are just over the moon. Remember, they had the shootout last fall at uh, Monterey when it was Mazda Raceway Laguna Sega. Kyle Kaiser, who's competing in IndyCar this year, he was the Indy Lights champion that season. He entered, uh, and he just said he had never driven anything like a global MX-5 Cup car. So the platform is phenomenal. You can't beat the price. And when we do get back to green flag racing, I promise you're going to see something unlike anything else. Uh, car 20, uh, that is uh, Hernan Palermo. Uh, they've looked at the video repeatedly and uh, a post-race penalty for avoidable, avoidable contact on the race. Uh, before we go back green, let's go back to pit lane. A quick note from Jake Query. Just wanted to give kind of a tip of the cap, guys, to that six sideways race team because they were able to put on a new BF Goodrich tire front right on that machine of Robert Noaker. The problem is Noaker's Auto Body is one of the sponsors. They could use them right here right now because that front right is just simply crunched too far underneath the front right headlight as a result it would have some of that body of the machine rubbing against that tire so it doesn't matter that they were able to change the wheel and the tire itself they're going to have some body repair to get this thing ready if they want to try to run it tomorrow so it is terminal four today but an excellent job in getting everything to the point where they could then even get to the point of assessing that particular diagnosis for the six sideways machine uh, ortiz 13 points back coming into the race weekend 
He's currently shown as 20th, as you mentioned earlier, Nick. A massive points hit for him. However, good news for guys like Roland, especially Sparks, who's 21 points back in East B1. Yeah, and uh, and Robert Stout, who enters this weekend second in points. Uh, he sits fourth on the racetrack. Our points leader, Nico Rieger, going to restart in 13th. So he made it through that accident, though, Mark. Uh, still buried in the field as we are set to go racing once again here in Portland. Nathaniel Sparks, quick on the accelerator out of turn number 12. Yeah, he got off of turn number 12 in a hurry with the field in tow and they stay single file now as they set up for turn number one. We'll see if Bickers or Celine Roland jumps out of line. Those front four separate themselves a little bit. That's Robert Stout popping to the high side. They want to go single file into the turn, but Celine Roland says, yeah, I don't think so. Now they go nose to tail. It is a battle for second now off of turn number three. Boy, Stout kind of stayed off the throttle through turns two and three and let uh, Bickers and Roland battle it out, and he was able to get a nice run out of turn three and launched himself from fourth all the way now into the second position as Nathaniel Sparks leads him through the S's. It's Stout who moves to second and then Bickers and Roland throwing a few elbows there, Mark, for third. Yep, Celine Roland wants that position, that third spot, and I think he had poised himself to grab second, but it didn't happen and he fell to fourth, but his mirror is full of that 77 machine of Luke Oxner, so those cars running nose to tail, all three of them, as they hit that bending long back stretch, if you will, and uh, tackle turn number eight. Yeah, it's one of the fastest part of the racetracks. We've seen a lot of drivers not be able to get their cars woed down for the uh, kind of kink left-hander. Roland's going to look to the inside. He's going to get that car woed down and make the pass. So Celine Roland moves into the uh, third position. And how about Brian Ortiz, Mark, all the way back there in that damaged green and white car? Looks like he is already starting to pick his way through the back market. Yeah, that's a pretty fast race car, and it was at the start. And he's got a lot of work to do to minimize the damage. Damage. Meanwhile, the front three crossed the start-finish line, and it sparks Stout, Roland, Bickers, and Oxner in the top five. Oh, oh boy, big gosh. hit as Joey Bickers did an absolute dive bomb to the inside, trying to go from fourth to the lead. He could not get that car woed down and absolutely pile-drived our leader, Nathaniel Sparks. Heavy left front damage. Sparks' wounded race car uh, is going to slip back to the fourth position as he's getting freight trained. Stout and Roland now take over the top two spots, but boy, Mark, heavy damage. Looks like our leader has the right front completely towed out as we're going to see a replay. That's Bickers to the inside, and, and Tony... Again, I, I just don't know how he expected that was going to work in turn one. Wow, I, I'm I'm with you, Nick. I'm befuddled, to say the least. I have no idea how Joey Bickers, oh, my gosh, he comes in like a wrecking ball, to quote your favorite singer, and I have <laughs> no idea what Joey Bickers was thinking there. And honestly, that's maybe the most surprising thing I've seen in a year of MX-5 Cup racing. That's going to bring out the full course yellow. And it's, of course, not an intentional, an intentional move at all no. on Bickers' part. But lap two, really the first green flag lap of the race, and Joey throws it in there in turn one like that. I would love if Jake can get an opportunity to talk with uh, Joey Bickers because that's the most surprising thing I've seen in two years of MX-5 Cup racing. Car 99 stop and hold to the pit box for passing the pace car and not following race, uh, race control uh, instructions, Kemper, and the 34 and 8. Obviously, Nick, that's under review. Yeah, that, race I, I think there's going to be. They want to take a look at that, Nick. They're not real happy with how that unfolded. Boy, so. got it just heartbroken though for Nathaniel Sparks, the pole sitter. Sparky had a uh, fast race car, looked pretty good on that opening lap. When we went back to green flag racing, uh, Robert Stout had a run. Roland had a run. Uh, it was going to get tight down into turn one, but you see the fourth car back, Joey Bickers, an evasive move to the inside to try to get around Celine Roland and then just couldn't get that car woed down and drives right into the side of Nathaniel Sparks. We saw him driving through the dirt with just a severe right front suspension damage. Uh, that is uh, a move mark that, again, race control is going to look at, and I think we can all guess where they're going to rule. That is, uh, boy, just a, a very aggressive move. Uh, from Joey Bickers that spilled over and took out our race leader. I'll tell you, it, it, the beneficiaries there, Stout and Roland, they were really, really lucky. And oh. Those guys shot right back across the racetrack into their path. They barely missed him. And Oxner, 
Oxner set himself up, Nick, in the 77 car to avoid all of that because at the entrance to turn number one, look how wide he is there. I don't know if he anticipated it or maybe his car's just more comfortable taking that track through. But the 77 of Oxner, uh, it, 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 the pretty good anticipation there to stay out of that mess entirely. Important to point out that these are timed races and the clock uh, continues to roll. It was scheduled for 45 minutes, so the amount of laps that uh, we complete today uh, really doesn't matter. The clock continues to run as we're down to 27 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, not nearly as much green flag racing as uh, we're used to seeing, Mark, as we've gotten towards the end of the season. And uh, guys are aggressive as uh, Joey Bicker sits Leaning against the wall is his disabled uh, Mazda MX-5 out of the race. Well, don't we think this is, in fact, the byproduct of the fact that the, the, the number two driver in points, uh, Robert Stout, 11 back, Ortiz, 13 back, Roman 19 back, Sparks, 21 back. I mean, guys are going to get aggressive because their chances to win the championship are going away. Yeah, and you could chalk all that up to the fact that, uh, that Nico Rieger was just a little off, didn't have a great weekend at Mid-Ohio because he had a, I don't want to say a dominating championship lead, but a little bit of cushion. Uh, he walks out of mid-Ohio with a couple rough results, and it just brought it, as you mentioned, everybody back to the pack uh, or back to the front of the championship standings. And I think now, Tony, guys see a chance to win a championship, and clearly they're going for it here at Portland. There are so many reasons why we're seeing the racing, the nature that it is right now, and I think it's tough to put your finger on a one dead set option. I think Portland International encourages some pretty tight and close racing, yeah. and the fact that there's that festival turn, as I've heard Michael Young call it, that one, two, three chicane right there at the very first corner. We haven't gone to a track that features an opening corner like that all season long, whether it was Circuit of the Americas, Barber, Road America, or Mid-Ohio. There's been no stop-and-go, point-and-shoot kind of corner that these cars have been on all season long. I think that's encouraging some really tight and hairy restarts. So uh, I'm still honestly amazed at what we've just seen because uh, – in the past two years, since Global MX-5 Cup Racing has partnered with Anderson Promotions, who we all know puts on the Mazda Road to Indy, they have become sanctioned and controlled by the IndyCar series. In the past, the series was run by the SCCA, and I think we saw much rougher driving because standards weren't nearly as high when the SCCA ran this series. They were not as high as the IndyCar, and IndyCar race control. Folks need to know that this race is being run under the direction yeah. of IndyCar race director Kyle Novak. Okay, so this is IndyCar race control calling the shots and the penalties and the stops and the goes in this race. My point in all this is, is in the last two years, Global MX-5 Cup Racing has seen the standards of what's acceptable raised through the roof. That move is something I would have never expected to see uh, ever since IndyCar took over. Again, don't think for a second Joey Bickers had any ill intent in that, but really just such a surprising move. Very surprised to see that. And to no one's surprise, post-race penalty for the 34 uh, because of uh, avoidable contact. Yeah, and to kind of parlay off of, of Tony's point there, this is definitely the oddity. And, and Mark, you've been around motorsports longer than I have. It doesn't matter if you're at a dirt track uh, on a Saturday night, whether it's Formula One, NASCAR, IndyCar, or MX-5. Uh, there are times that you're going to have the cleanest race in the world where these guys look like world-class drivers, and then there's going to be every once in a while, you're going to have those races where uh, things just happen. It doesn't matter what level it's at, and clearly we've got one of those where uh, – so far, this race kind of resembles a bunch of uh, marbles in a blender rather than an auto race. Uh, it's a shame because we know how much these, these drivers put into these efforts. And, uh, this torn up race cars is going to be a little expensive, but uh, certainly we've still got 24 minutes to decide who's going to win this one. I guess we sold it too hard in the pre race, <laughs> didn't we? I mean, we talked about what uh, what a competitive and ultra exciting form of racing it is. And uh, I agree with both you and Tony. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is the exception rather than the rule, Tony, in terms of what we're used to seeing in the series. Here's the deal, Mark James. You can't oversell Global MX-5 Cup Racing too hard. Now, we might have oversold how many green flag laps we were going to see, <laughs> but I always like to say, you know, the Global MX-5 Cup Racing, it's like a promo for a monster truck show, you know. We'll sell you the whole seat. You're only going to need the edge when you right. see MX-5 Cup Racing because it always is exciting. Yes, this round nine here in Portland is a little bit, uh, how should we say, hairier than we've seen in the eight previous rounds of racing. But I do think once we get under green flag conditions and we are able to get a lap or two under the green flag, we should see this not necessarily calm down. That's not the phrase I want to use, but um, clean up a little bit. And I still think we're in for a very exciting the last couple of laps with a lot of action coming to the finish line. Well, and let, let's talk about uh, some of the guys who, who this wild start, who it benefits. How about uh, Alex Machara, who, who started uh, all the way back 
Uh, let's see, way deep in the field. Where was he at? 14th. He's up into the fifth position. Zach Lee's running fourth. Jesse Smith is up to the sixth position. Uh, how about uh, Keith Jensen, uh, Bellardo? Those drivers started deep in this field, and all of a sudden, Mark, running in the top ten and uh, and seeing the front of the field, which is, is, is a little different and kind of nice. Yeah, and uh, Rigger snuck up a little bit, too. I mean, he's hanging around in that top ten, and he is a guy that we have seen be ultra competitive from time to time. The biggest beneficiary right now is the uh, is the of course the 28 of Robert Stout, the 2017 Global MX5 Cup Rookie of the Year, and uh, uh, that's a guy that we've learned uh, that lives in Indianapolis now, native of Palm Springs. If it's had wheels and a motor, chances are he's probably driven it at some point. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the points kind of as they run now. Uh, Stout is up to 161 points. Rolando 160. And our championship leader, Nico Rigger, at 167. So for that, uh, the, the pro class mark now, as they run right now, everyone, the top three within seven points. So uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if Rigger can get up there. But you're right. Robert Stout is super versatile race car driver in that Lucas Oil TV machine. And he's going to get back on the accelerator mark as we are going to go back to green with uh, just under 22 minutes to go here in MX-5 at Portland. Boy, Celine Roland right there off that final turn, and he jumps to the inside, now jumps back in line. La uh, Luke Oxner is the third car in that train as they head toward turn number one. Roland entertaining thoughts of going to the bottom of the racetrack. They get door handle to door handle. It looks like Celine Roland is going to try to grab that top spot. He will indeed into turn number one. Keeps it that short little switch back to turns two and then gets into turn number three. Oxner remains in the third position, but a great move, a great drag down that main straightaway by Celine Roland. Loved what I saw from that soul red Mazda MX-5 of Celine Roland using the curbing right side up on the curbing uh, into turn number one, left side at the exit, and uh, really stretches that lead out here as we've gone back to green flag racing. Further back, it's like everybody kind of stay in single file and hopefully establishing a bit of a rhythm, but it is Celine Roland through turn at number seven and through the kink in turn eight. They'll accelerate down that back straightaway. Oxner, Mark, really not letting Robert Stout get away as they're separated by just a car. Uh, that car worked really well through five and six, and he is right on the rear bumper now. We'll see if he can do anything down that bending back straightaway. See if he gets any kind of a draft. You can pop out of line and get it before they get to turn number 10. He's right there. Stout trying to hold on to that position, and you can bet that Celine Roland is saying, go ahead and slug it out, boys. This is set up for the final series of turns. Yep, they come out of turn at number 12. Celine Roland is your leader. He'll take that Soul Red Masa all the way to the outside. It looks like we've got a spinning car on the racetrack. That's number 53, Keith Jensen, who was one of those cars, Mark, that I just mentioned. It kind of cycled his way up into the top 10. That's going to be a local yellow. It does look like Jensen's going to get that bright blue Mazda MX-5 fired back up as the leaders are into turn one and two. And they attack the curbing end of one and two, and Stout trying to keep pace with Roland. Got a really good run off the final turn, much like Roland did last time. Got a feeling Luke Oxner's got a really fast race car, and he's biding his time a bit. Roland trying to check out a bit. He's got about a two-car length advantage now as they work their way through five, six, and seven. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Luke Oxner. Nice to see him up front as we are seeing a replay now of uh, the incident involving Keith Jensen, who got a little wide through turn 11. Thankfully, just a one-car incident, but certainly a tough break for Jensen. But how about Luke Oxner, Tony Laporta? I mean, he's a guy that's just week in, week out, has gotten a little bit stronger uh, this season. He's just one top five finish. It came at mid-Ohio in race number one, and here he is up front, qualified second, has a chance to get a win here at MX-5. You're absolutely right, Nick, and I might be a homer, but I'm okay with that in this case because uh, Luke Oxner, not from there originally, but now lives up in northern Colorado, the place that I'm grateful and honored to say that I actually hail from originally. He races out of Greeley, Colorado for White Racing. Bruce White owns the team, and actually this weekend, Brandon White competing in the Challenger Cup category, so that gives White Racing their first double entry in the MX-5 Cup category for the first time ever, and Luke has just really put together good races and good sessions all year. The Lux always ran out at the wrong time. I guess that's every racer's story, but as we watch a great battle here, starting to shape up between Roland and Stout. Luke Oxner really impressing me. I've had the honor of getting to know him and watch him these past two years in MX-5 Cup racing, and I think Luke isn't just due. That's such a cliche phrase I hate to use, but I really do think his time is coming where you're going to see him not only stand on the podium, but fight for race wins. He's in that dark blue with those can't-miss-em bright yellow rims, and uh, really great to see Luke Oxner showing the speed that he's had all season long. Little by little, Celine Roland started to get a bit of an advantage over that battle for second between Stout and Oxner. 
Uh, Zach Lee, Schmidt trying to keep pace. That's your top five in the 77 right there on Robert Stout as they uh, start to set up for that long back straightaway now. And again, that's a bender to the right. They can gain plenty of speed through there for sure. They clear it now and start to set up for that bending right-hander. And Oxer's got a nice run out of turn number eight. He's going to pop to the outside, not quite close enough to get alongside. Now it looks like he'll show him a fender. They'll go side by side. Oxner in that navy blue and yellow car. Robert Stout in the red, white, and blue. And move Luke Oxner up into the second spot mark as our leader kicks up a little dirt. But Oxner is the man on the move as he has charged that 77 machine into the second spot. Now he'll try to set his sights on the leader. Yeah, that car looked fast from the very beginning for sure. And he's avoided uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, disaster, potential disaster in front of him. The 69 of Michael Dynan. He'll do no better than 22nd today, Jake Query. He was one of the casualties of that mix-up at the outset of this race, Michael. I know it's not fun to now have to be a spectator. Let's go back to the start of this race. What did you see? It was crazy there. A number of different cars involved. What was your version of what happened? I mean, I was on the outside coming into turn one. Um, I thought I'd break pretty happened was I just got hit from behind and from that point on it was just uh, going for a ride so I think some people tried to overshoot it there were too many cars too wide um, but yeah it's very unfortunate I'm not pleased with the result but it's always race two tomorrow you know it's interesting this track being so flat obviously we've seen other places with elevation changes you don't really get that here does that create for drivers a false sense of pass opportunity where all of a sudden maybe you're going three wide where you shouldn't um, I think it can for certain drivers. Um, yeah. I personally do not experience that here, but I'm sure. Unfortunately, you were involved where others did, right? Yes, exactly. Michael, I appreciate the time. All right, thank you. Michael Dynan, again, car number 69. He was one. They tried to give it a go, guys, but again, same thing we've seen with a number of the machines at the outset of the race. Got caught up and collected the damage on the front just simply too much. Speaking about that turn one opportunity, we're going to see it again here, Mark, with the possibility of a change for the lead. Uh, Luke Oxner, will he take a peek to the bottom side of Celine Roland? He's cleared stout and put all kind of pressure on the leader now as they work their way through one and two. Right now, it appears as though the car of Roland handling the more technical portions of the race course a little better. They're setting up for five, six, and seven, Nick. It'll be interesting to see if Oxner can pull off what he did on Stout a couple of laps ago when he worked his way around him in that bending uh, through that bending part of the racetrack through eight leading to nine. A little further back, one of the fastest cars on the racetracks, that white and green number four machine, that's Brian Ortiz. I was blown away by how he's charging through the field. Tough part, though, Mark, about our championship contender. He is a lap down in that damaged Mazda. So, wow, he's kind of carving his way through the field. And, and he's going to need a caution and get all the way to the front for it to pay off. I'll tell you what I'm noticing, though, early on, Mark, is these guys up front are taking care of each other now through turns one and two because of all the carnage. Luke Oxner's discovered that, hey, the spot to get him is down this long back straightaway, and he's got another run on Celine Roland. He wants to pop out of line. At least he's entertaining thoughts of that and decides better of it. Boy, it's, when they enter that turn there, they always kick up that dirt and the dust, and uh, uh, that, that's the fast way around the racetrack for sure. Off of turn number 12, they'll go awfully wide. They'll be just off of that outside retaining wall. Inches, in fact. Stout and Lee trying to keep pace, and we'll see if Oxner gets any momentum down that straightaway now as they start to set up for turn number one. And Tony right behind those guys up front. A nice run for Jesse Schmidt. Our championship leader, Nico Rieger. He's got some damage but he's pointing his way up to sixth position. So all of a sudden, things starting to tighten up and a rubber band like we're so used to seeing in MX. Well, exactly, Nick. You're exactly right about Nico Rieger. Despite having a little bit of damage and being involved in some of that dust up at the start, Rieger knows. He comes into this weekend with a championship point lead. He's just two races, well, three after this one away from getting that Global MX-5 Cup championship and the Mazda scholarship Money that comes with it. So my hat off to Nico Rieger for doing everything he can to stay right up in the mix and gain maximum points. There you see a great shot of that 0-1. That's the car that leads the championship point. And then as we watch this fight from lead, guys, Mark, you hit on it a little bit. Luke Oxner's found out that where he is really strong is pretty much out of 7 down the long yeah. bending back straightaway and then into 10, 11, and 12. But where Celine Roland seems to be very strong and be able to put a little bit of gap between he and the 77 is going in through turns 1, 2, and 3. But now Oxner 
Oxner makes something happen on the outside as they go down the back straight. Guys, great battle for leader. Oxner's going to lead his first time ever here in 2018 in Global MX5 Cup racing. White racing to the front. Uh, Roland is not going to go away quietly. Meanwhile, Robert Stout is under attack. The 48 of Zach Lee. Schmidt's number nine, and you mentioned Nico Rigger. They're all right there, Nick. Yeah, you know, after a closer look at Nico Rigger, he's just got a little rear end damage. That's nothing that we've seen in MX5. Oxner, though, leads that lap, as Tony talked about, with just under 13 minutes to go. Uh, Celine Roland's going to work the outside. They're going to take care of each other through turns one and two. This is that part of the racetrack, though, where Roland's been pretty strong. Further back, we see Brian Ortiz pass Nico Rieger. Again, Ortiz a lap down, trying to charge back up to the front. But Mark, a nice little breakaway for the front, too, as we now look at third, fourth, and fifth make their way through turn four. Uh, Luke Oxter says his uh, a favorite corner on the, the MX-5 Cup schedule last year was certainly Laguna Seca, the cork group. He had some success at Laguna Seca, that spec boxster series, uh, Tony. It's funny, his favorite corner is possibly the most technically challenging and elevated corner in all of North American racing, and he's having his best weekend ever here at the flattest track we've gone to in two seasons, but I guess you don't question it when it's working. Luke Oxner really impressing me, and again, I love to see it. The young man from northern Colorado has now began to put even a little bit of a gap, it looks like, guys, between he and rookie of the year candidate Celine Roland, who races out of Orlando, Florida. They come down the back straightaway, get ready for 9, 10, and 11. And there's not just a little bit, but there's significant daylight between the 77-year leader and the 87 in second place. And, Nick, you hit on it already. But when they roll through that 9, 10, 11, well, 10, 11, and 12 complex, they still catch that right-hander down oh, on the yeah. inside. And they're kicking up a little bit of dust. But what's so impressed about that is they do it lap after lap, which means... They're aiming for it. They're using every bit of track they can here at PIR, then the curbing, and then a little bit more as they kick up the dust going in through the corners here. How about Zach Lee, one of the Masters Class drivers who has worked his way into podium position as he got around Robert Stout as that battle rages into turns one and two. Stout kicked back to fourth. Jesse Schmidt runs in the fifth position. Then you've got that lap car of Ortiz and the sixth place running car of our points leader, Nico Rieger. Uh, Mark, no doubt the front two starting to get away. That battle for third is a good one as Lee and that bright white car under attack from Robert Stout. Uh, but, uh, Tony, how big is this for Nico Rieger with all of that disaster? I mean, this could have been a huge points hit for him, and he has soldiered his way, fought and scrapped to get his way back into the sixth position. Oh, absolutely. It's like I was just saying. He knows that he can lose a lot or he can gain a lot when guys like Brian Ortiz have bad luck. So Nico Rieger, again, doing exactly what championship winners do, and that soldier through and put their head down, and it might not be the funnest car to drive right now. He's not running with the pace he's typically used to, but he's doing exactly what he needs to do. And if we hand him that championship check in about a month's time at Monticello Motor Club up in New York. He's going to look back on this weekend at Portland International and know he did what he had to. Also, guys, an interesting point, Nick, you just did a great job about talking about Zach Lee in the Masters category. I have a story I want to bring up about him in a moment, but when we look a little bit farther down the field, it looks like 10th and 11th, Charlie Bellarado and Alex Walensky running 10th and 11th. They are P1 and P2. Bellarado, your leader, Walensky, second in the Challenger Cup coming into this weekend. They are tied for the championship lead <laughs> great in the battle. challenger class. Yeah, it's a great battle, no doubt. Up front, though, uh, again, it's the battle for third. And I'll tell you what, Mark, Brian Ortiz is... is yeah, we talk about how Nico Rieger's doing everything he needs to make sure that he, he's managing maybe a mediocre weekend and, and holding that car down in the sixth position. Brian Ortiz is doing everything he can. A lap down, he knows his only chance uh, to get back into this fight is to charge all the way past the leaders and hope for a full course of caution, which we've gotten to today. Uh, he's awful fast, one of the quickest cars on the racetrack. Problem is, we're under about nine yeah. minutes to go in this race. Even if he gets up there, not sure there's going to be enough time. Yeah, time winding down, and if he gets up there and, and it's going to be another couple of laps before he has any hopes of catching the, the leaders in the field Nick and let's face it I, I think as you mentioned with the time left he, he might hear from race control if he gets up there among the leaders, we're looking at three and a half, four minutes left in the race. He, he won't be able to do much with that for sure. But, uh, you know, typically we see more lead changes and we see more different leaders. But in terms of total passes with the cars that have been running today, Nick, 
We're at 135 total <laughs> passes, which gives you an idea of the incredible competitiveness that you see in the series. Oh, and let's also point out that we lost about a third of the field right. in the first couple laps. So uh, that number certainly, certainly would have shot through the roof. Uh, see a nice little battle a little bit further back as uh, the 97 machine of Brian Henderson has kind of been hounding our points leader. There's Ortiz, the lap car, the damaged lap car. It shows how fast he still is as he looks to the outside of Robert Stout, who's going to shoot up the inside and try to get around Zach Lee for that third position front two getting away but does uh, a really good battle mark third fourth fifth and sixth here at portland yep and we continue to watch it meanwhile the leaders continue to pull away it's oxner and roland and the question is nick uh, we've seen it in mid-ohio we've seen it at barber motorsports park and other venues where we race do you think right now that celine roland is just biding his time or is oxner just that much faster than him i guess we'll find out in the next lap and a half or two because time continues to wind down well as tony talked about i mean uh, this is surprising to see luke oxner up front leading and, and with a chance to win a race but he's no slouch and has obviously had a really good weekend qualified second for this race so started up front he's got the pace Roland, this has kind of become a uh, week in, week out thing to see him up front. So, yeah, he's got about seven and a half minutes to try to uh, to set him up. These drivers are turning laps at uh, just under 90 seconds. So, uh, you know, you do the math and you've got about four or five laps to work with here at Portland. But the, the, the thing is, Roland's not letting him get away, Mark. A, a part, different parts of this racetrack, there he's able to close up. Maybe not close enough to get a run down into turn one, but he is not letting the driver of that 77 get away. And Tony Boston importantly let's face it for Celine Roland we'll see if he makes a move into turn number one he's going to take a peek and Oxford's going to shut the door that it, it, it risk versus reward here because the guys that he's chasing in terms of the championship all of those guys are behind him right now yeah absolutely and so Celine Roland has just a little bit more to lose Mark when you talk about risk versus reward because he's a race winner this season he's fighting not only for rookie of the year but he's a little bit of ways out from getting that championship possibility not when we go to Monticello but yeah he's in the top five in the championship points that he's fighting for a lot. Luke Oxner just unfortunately hasn't had the results. Has he had the speed? Yes, absolutely. But he has he had the results that Roland has had? No. So you talk about who's got a little bit more to gain, who's got a little more to lose. Well, the guy leading the race right now has got a lot more to gain, and Roland, well, He's got just a little bit more to lose. If I'm Luke Ochsner and I'm behind the wheel, that number 77, I am setting all my sights on the road ahead of me. I'm ripping that rear view mirror off from that MX-5 Cup car. I'm throwing it down in the wheel wells, and I'm driving straight ahead as fast as I can for these last couple laps because Luke Ochsner, guys, is only a few laps away from scoring his first ever win in Global MX-5 Cup. Celine Roland, he doesn't care, but he's already got one. Ortiz is not playing nice with those guys at all. <laughs> no, Ortiz just got around. He got around Lee, and now he got around Robert Stout. That's not for position, but he is uh, running third on the racetrack. I think some of those guys are probably hoping that Ortiz can check out and leave us. Leave us alone for these last few laps. We're racing for a podium finish here. Stout's got that third spot right now. Lee's giving chase. Rieger, Brian Henderson down the front straightaway here. And uh, looks like a little drafted. They may not be done with Ortiz. This has been some good racing. Uh, Mark, just outside of the top two. Uh, Stout, Lee, Rigger, those guys all running behind Brian Ortiz. And to give you a how, an idea how fast that car of Ortiz is, Nick, he's starting to pull away from that pack. But meanwhile, think, speaking of pulling away, it's a two-horse race right now. It's Oxner and Roland, no doubt about it. They're already setting up for turn number seven, while the rest of the field's just now going through five and six. And just five minutes to go here at Portland International Raceway in the battery tender Global MX-5 Cup, presented by BF Goodrich Tires. Boy, our second place uh, running car, Celine Roland, went a little wide there at the exit of turn seven. That's going to allow Luke Oxter, uh, Tony, to uh, pull about a six-seven car length advantage, and that's the spot you want to do it down that fast, long back straight. Away. That couldn't have come at a worse time for Celine Roland, guys. And again, that goes back to what I said in pre-race comments, talking about how these cars, you really need to master your momentum. And boy, you talk about a track where it's going to be super critical to be momentum carrying is Portland International Raceway so and then of course that comes on the back side of the racetrack where Luke Oxner has been making all of his yeah. time up so unfortunately Celine Roland picked the absolute worst spot on the racetrack to have a lapse in judgment drop that left front wheel off kick up the dirt and folks at home might not think it but that does so much damage to that straight line speed going down the back straight over here big spin down here it looks like what is that turn eight guys that should be the 31 yeah that's uh, the 31 of Leal Brooks Leal has
has spun. He's one of the uh, rookies yeah. here in MX5, Mark. And the 33 of Batra will uh, go into the break in turn number one and uh, threw away the potential for a top ten finish today. Yep, here's a replay of uh, the incident involving Leal as he just gets the left sides off the racetrack and that slick sideways Mazda MX-5 spun to the inside of the track, threw a little dirt uh, up onto the racetrack, but uh, just a local yellow as he got that 31 machine fired back up. Uh, we look a little bit further back, though, Mark. Here is the battle for the lead. Roland starting to inch back up. Call it about six car lengths as they streak away from Robert Stout leading this train in third. Yep, got a lot of work to do for sure as we see the rest of the field from third on to about seventh or eighth. Those guys running plenty wide. Nico Rieger looks like he wants to pick up a spot on Zach Lee. That is the battle for fourth. It looks like a pretty good one. Meanwhile, Stout is under assault as they set up for turn number eight. Yeah, Ortiz is uh, giving chase to Stout. We saw Rieger in that black car pops to the inside. An aggressive look to the inside. Didn't have the momentum though to get alongside Zach Lee. He'll fall back about a car length between he and Lee. And there is Brian Henderson having a really nice day in that red, yellow, and black car. Uh, running in the sixth spot with Jesse Schmidt giving chase as well. Schmidt runs in seventh. Back up front. Your leader set up for turn number one. It's about a three car length advantage now for Luke Oxner over Celine Roland. And that battle from third on back it says up for turn number one. Those guys stay nose to tail as the opportunities for Celine Roland to do something with Luke Oxner starting to wane now as they set up for five and six. Final couple of laps here at Portland International Raceway. You mentioned uh, Nico Rieger in that black and green 01 car trying to get into the fourth position. Back up front. There's your leaders. Then we've got a big gap to third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh with that green and white car of Ortiz as the wild card. A lap down, Tony, with just uh, two minutes to go here in Portland. Yeah, the wild card is the perfect name for Brian Ortiz. He is giving Robert Stout absolute fits right here. And folks, if you're sitting around the track or you're watching on the live stream right now, Robert Stout and that white, blue, and red McCombie McAleer Lucas Oil Racing TV sponsored MX5 Cup car. That's not a mouthful. He's getting harassed by that white and green car of Brian Ortiz, but Nick calls him the wild card for the reason because he He's a lap down. He's not competing for position. I wonder if they're at all instructing Robert Stout to just let Ortiz go because, of course, the thing we all fear seeing, guys, the obvious worst-case scenario, well, is Robert Stout racing Brian Ortiz a little too hard, there being an issue, and Brian Ortiz and Robert Stout taking each other out. Robert Stout currently standing on the podium with a P3 finish. He should honestly just let Ortiz go and get to the line as we see the white flag flying here. But, guys, Think about what the driver, that 77, Luke Oxner, is going through right now. He's got enough of an advantage. We typically don't see this big of a gap on the last lap between P1 and P2. All Oxner needs to do is drive a clean last couple of, what is it, six, seven corners to go yeah. here. His heart's got to be pounding. He is half of a lap away from winning his first ever victory here in Global MX-5 Cup Racing. Seven tenths of a second, the advantage and an uncharacteristic eight seconds back to third place as they work their way through five, six, and seven. Luke Oxner very, very quick from the start. He started on the outside of the front row. He avoided all of that carnage in turn number one uh, through the first two circuits there, Nick. Some of the contenders, of usual contenders like Sparks and Bickers and Noaker, those guys, uh, they did not uh, stick around for the finish. Ortiz will finish a lap down, down that short or that long straightaway through that uh, short complex through 9, 10, 11, and 12. How about Oxner, Dick Yeoman? Bring him home as he comes off the final turn for the final time. Yep, Celine Roland is pedaling all he can on this final lap. Doesn't look like it's going to be enough. He'll swing wide. Out of turn number 12, Luke Oxner is going to score the win in the battery tender Global MX-5 Cup presented by BF Goodrich Tires. Left hand out the window pumping in celebration. Tony, what a big win for Luke Oxner in car 77. Hey guys, I'm stoked for Luke Oxner and I gave him a hard time on the PA system yesterday at the autograph session for these MX-5 Cup drivers. I said, Luke Oxner's got a pretty tough life. He drives race cars on the weekends and he Instagrams all the hikes and mountain trips he takes in the state of Colorado. Well, he does have a really cool Instagram where you get to see where he goes and the adventures he goes on the mountains of Colorado. Well, this weekend, he's got some new photos to put on that Instagram page and it's going to be the ones of him holding the first place trophy here in Portland, Oregon. Luke Oxner, a first-time winner here in the MX-5 Cup. 
This is very cool to see. You can always tell when it's the first time winner, too, because that fist came out the window as he was crossing. <laughs> and it the, hasn't uh, gone down. Start finish I don't, line. Yeah, I don't think it's gone down. Continue to pump the fist. And, and, and we mentioned that his favorite uh, turn would be the uh, corkscrew at Laguna Seca because of the success that he had there in another series. I think maybe Portland might yeah, leapfrog I, over Laguna Seca. I, I think uh, turn nine, where he took the lead from Celine Roland back after the halfway point of this race, might just start to inch its way towards his favorite corner. But honestly, I don't think there we go. The fist finally. <laughs> he comes back into the car. He grabs the gear, puts it back out. But for Bruce White, the owner of White Racing, again, Brandon White making his debut in MX5 Cup Racing this weekend. But Luke Oxner, guys, uh, and I know I sound like such a homer here, but he's a really great kid. He's always got a smile. I honestly have never seen Luke Oxner without a smile on his face. He's always got a great attitude, willing to talk to any of us, let us know what's going on in the series. He'll talk you through anything you ask him. So for him to get this win here in Portland, Oregon, uh, very cool to see, and he did it in very heads up fashion yeah, by passing sure. Celine Roland right around the outside going down the back straightaway. What a win for Luke Oxner here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, race control not done assessing their opinions and rulings from those incidents to start this race. Uh, how about this? The 20 of Hernan Palermo and the number 34 of Joey Bickers get a 10-spot grid penalty for race number two for the contact from earlier in this race. And, Mark, it's hard to argue that. Uh, we just saw a couple drivers just a way too aggressive down into turn number one. I know it gets awful tight, uh, so that's going to be an uphill battle for, for both Bickers and, uh, and Palermo if they're able to get those cars repaired for the race tomorrow. Uh, we'll kind of shake out where that's going to put them in the starting order in tomorrow's broadcast. But today it is all about Luke Oxner, who scores the win here at Portland. Here's uh, how they finished. Oxner is your winner. Celine Roland with a really good point today. He'll come home in second. Robert Stout finishes third. What a great drive by Nico Rieger to avoid all the carnage. Started 11th right there mid-pack where we saw so many accidents. Uh, Rieger does a great job of avoiding the contact and comes home with a fourth place finish. Great job by Zach Lee as he's the top Masters class uh, driver coming home in the fifth position. Brian Henderson is sixth. Jesse Schmidt is seventh. Pachura is eighth. Uh, and Bellardo comes home in the ninth position, Tony, as we talked about uh, for, for that class. That's a big ninth place finish for driver car number 73. Zach Lee told me at Mid Ohio Sports Car Course last month after watching IndyCar qualifying take place, he goes, those guys are awesome. And I said, yeah, I agree with you, Zach. He goes, IndyCar's amazing. If I could ever just get a top five in MX5 Cup racing, he goes, I think I'd quit. I'd be so happy. Well, I really hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, he's got to come back tomorrow. He's got to come back because Zach Lee just won it in Masters. Getting that win in Challenger Cup is Charlie Bellarado, Nick, as you said. But Luke Oxner, a first-time winner here in the Battery Tender Global MX5 Cup. We got a great look at him down there on pit lane. He's putting on the Battery Tender hat. I'm going to run to victory lane. I can't wait to see this guy get on the top of the podium. Thanks for letting me hang out, guys. 9 a.m. We're back racing tomorrow for round 10 of 2018. Uh, good stuff. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, it is, it's interesting to note, uh, Nick Yeoman, uh, it's, <laughs> you would expect in, in, in the Mazda Road to Indy, and you would expect in the Verizon IndyCar Series some uh, some some difficulties when it comes to, uh, uh, to to fighting over track position in tight confines like one, two, and three. But with a passing that exists in this series, I'm 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 a little, quite frankly, taken aback by the lack of patience on the part of some of these drivers in this series. Well, but but you know what? I mean, we're at what round nine and ten. They took care of each other at, at the doubleheader at Coda. Did a really nice job at Barber Motorsports Park, Road America, that massive four-mile track. Lots of places to screw up and, and, and take each other out. Mid-Ohio was clean. So, uh, again, I'm just going to chalk this up to you're going to have these every once in a while in racing, no matter if it's at the well, highest the level or, or the lowest level. And you're right, a lot of young drivers in this class as well. Let's hear from the winner, though, Luke Oxner, standing by with Jake Query. He was born in Arkansas. He was raised in Colorado, and he comes to the summit here in Oregon. His first win. And Luke Oxner, congratulations. Take me through that particular run because it was a great win. That doesn't mean it was an easy one. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, It was pretty crazy on the start. I lost four spots instantly because I heard all these stories like, don't be on the outside into one, and like, I gotta, I gotta get a run and whatever, and just broke late. Next thing you know, five guys were past me, but after that, I got kind of lucky with uh, a couple of wrecks and just kind of was tried to race smart and make a couple of good passes, and 
hung on. Another great thing about it is the fact that you were holding off a guy who was very, very good in Celine Roland. Take me through what was going through your mind. Were you worried about where he was or just simply focused on what you were doing? Oh, yeah. I was checking the mirrors for him on the straights because, you know, Celine's a, he's a great driver and he races hard. So the last thing I wanted was going door to door with him. So uh, I was really happy we were able to keep away from him. And, um, yeah, it was just awesome. We made some setup changes yesterday just working on it, working on it, and really paid off. So had a great car and it was awesome. First win in the Global MX-5 Cup presented by BF Goodrich, and it might be the first of many more to come. But congratulations. Enjoy this first one. Thanks, Jake. All right, Luke Oxner. Luke Oxner, your winner here at Portland International Raceway uh, in race number one, round nine, for the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup presented by BF Goodrich Tires. Uh, Mo Murray joins us from Mazda. Mo, I know you are monitoring the stream. Folks watching online going to get a chance to, to see these guys battle it out tomorrow. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yep, 9 a.m. tomorrow. We had, a, we had a lot of people tune in to watch this one, a lot of great comments, a lot of great support for these drivers, particularly for Luke Oxner having his, his career day in, in the MX-5 Cup, Battery Tender MX-5 Cup. Yes, 9 a.m. tomorrow we'll be back on Mazda's YouTube channel, uh, and we'll do it all again. We'll race what's left of these cars, <laughs> although the crews will go to work tonight yeah. and they'll, they'll get them repaired. A lot of carnage, but uh, still a fantastic race and a first-time winner. Great job by Tony Laporta, Jake Query, and uh, Mark Janes for Mo Murray. My name's Nick Yeoman. Congratulations to Luke Oxner, the winner here at Portland in the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup, presented by BF Goodrich Tires.